and walk in wisdom. And if you'd like to follow along today, we will be in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. James is a small book in the New Testament. If you're new to the scriptures, you can find it towards the back of the New Testament, or you can follow on your phone, however you're following along today, or you can just follow along as we will place the scriptures on the screen as well. But we will be in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Now, I want you to think of a moment maybe in your favorite movie or television series, as you know I'm always referencing movies, where a character had something to say and they said it perfectly. Like the scene was written in in, in the perfect way. The the character said everything that he or she needed to say in that moment. I was watching a movie with one of these moments not too long ago. It's a movie called Air. Maybe some of you have seen this movie. It's about the story of when Nike signed Michael Jordan back in the early to mid-1980s. And there's a scene in the movie where a character played by Matt Damon sits across from Michael Jordan and his family. And he gives this pitch of, hey, here's why you should sign with us. And when you watch the movie with everything happening, your emotions get into it and you're like, oh yes, I can totally see why Michael Jordan signed with Nike after this pitch. This is the perfect pitch. It was the perfect moment. Matt Damon's character said all the right words in the right way, in the right time. I remember the scene in a conference room and I was so moved by this scene and I thought, man, I wish I could talk like that. Because have you been to a meeting before that you knew was maybe going to be a little bit tense or the stakes were high and you kept playing in your mind over and over again how you were going to say what you were going to say, what exactly you were going to say, how you were anticipating all the responses from the person to what you were going to say and you you had the perfect message planned out in your mind and then you got to the meeting and it didn't go the way you thought it would. You start to stumble on your words a little bit, or maybe the person you're talking to has a different disposition than what you had anticipated, and it's just not going the way, and you think, man, I wish I could talk like those people do in the movies, because they're so good at it. They don't, but what we don't realize is these aren't, you know, did Matt Damon's character in real life, I know it's based on a true story, but did he really speak that convincingly and eloquently? Maybe he did. But we watch these movies, do people really talk this way? Does it really work this way? Maybe if we could have a moment to write down all of our thoughts, maybe we could talk and communicate that way. But it's really hard to say everything we want to say the way in which we want to say it. And it can be hard to do that speaking, but it can also be difficult to do it in writing. Although some of us are better at that than others. When we get to James chapter 4 verses 1 through 12, as I was studying this passage and reading this text really closely, I kept thinking to myself, man, I wish I could write the way James was able to write because he packed so much information in an eloquent yet succinct way in James 4 verses 1 through 12. In fact, it's easy to read through this text really quickly because it's like he goes from one thing to another, but it's one brilliant idea to another brilliant idea. And it's like, Hey, I wonder if maybe like the Holy Spirit was inspiring this. Yes, he was. Because you're like, this is so perfectly written. This was so well put together. And it was actually in some ways difficult for me to say, how do I put this into a message? I could almost preach on each verse for however long. Because everything is written so succinctly. It's written so well. It's like it's something from a movie. You're like, this is perfect. This is, this is. It's like he takes a lot of his thoughts that we looked at earlier in the letter, he puts them into this part of the letter, and then he adds some additional thoughts as well, and he puts within this little section, James 4, 1 through 12, how to identify the things in our lives that keep us from growing closer to Christ, and then how to identify the process that we must engage in to grow closer to Jesus. And so I want us to think of this almost like we would think of some of our favorite scenes in a movie where every character says everything perfectly, so we listen really closely, we start to quote it, we start to memorize those scenes, we share them with our friends. I want us to think through James 4, 1 through 12 in this way, because what James says here is so powerful and so valuable, I think we need to listen really closely. Because he has some really important things to say that was not just important 2,000 years ago to his original audience, but they're just as relevant and important today. 
So let's listen closely. And then let's lean into this text. Let's study it as a church together. Let's start to memorize it and make it a part of our lives. James is walking through a progression of that which keeps us away from Christ and how we can grow into being more like Christ. So the first thing that James points out in this text is the problem with people. Now, I have a news flash for all of us. When it comes to the problem with people, you're a part of the problem. <laughs> I'm a part of the problem. We are all a part of the problem. And the problem or problems that James begins to address in this text, we have all in some way contributed to or been a part of the problem. Every one of us in some way has fallen into some of the sinful activity and actions that James addresses in this text. So I know sometimes when we're reading a text like this, it could be easy to think of other people. Yeah, they need to hear this. But maybe we should just pause for a moment and think, okay, what do I need to hear in this? And not always be thinking about somebody else. So James starts with this in James chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. He said, where do wars come from? Why do people among you fight? It all comes from within, doesn't it? From your desires for pleasure which make war in your members. You want something and you haven't got it. So you murder someone. You long to possess something, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war. The reason you don't have it is because you don't ask for it. And when you do ask, you don't get it because you are wrongly intending to spend it on your pleasures. See what I mean here? This is just three verses, and James covers a lot of ground here. In verse 1, James talks about the war that's happening within us. In verse 2, he talks about those who are murdering. And then in verse 3, he goes on to address those who ask God and request, make requests of God, but do it with wrong motives. He addresses a lot here in just three verses, but there's a progression here for the problem with people. And the progression goes something like this. There's a war within us. And this war within, if we give in to the war within, to just, as we go back to last week's message, the war within that leads to jealousy and boasting or lying, that war within can lead us to what he addresses in verse 2, anger. Now, James directly addresses murder in this text. Some scholars believe that James is actually calling out possibly some of his Jewish brothers who would have been gathered in a group called the Zealots who were enacting in violence to overthrow Rome. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not the way of Jesus. He's calling out this, this sect, this group within his own community and saying, no, that's not what we're supposed to be doing here. So you might be listening to this and saying, well, you know, good, clear, I, I didn't murder anyone, I'm not a part of this. But if we take murder and we associate it with the concept of anger like Jesus does in Matthew chapter 5, then we all might need to pay attention to our hearts. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to an older generation, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother will be subjected to judgment. And whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council. And whoever says fool will be sent to fiery hell. Jesus says, don't even get anywhere close to murder. Don't, he, said, he warns us to not be consumed by anger. So if we were to maybe take a modern application from what James is saying here, James is saying there's a war within us, and we can know we've given in to that war within when we start to be driven, when we give in to anger and we are driven by anger anger, when we live a life that's just frustrated and bitter and not forgiving others. And then from that, James says that our motives become twisted. And we wonder why. Why does it seem like God's not responding? Why does it seem like God doesn't listen to me? And James is saying it's because when you're asking God, you're asking with the wrong motives. How many of us, before we go into prayer and ask God, start with this. Jesus, reveal to me what I need to repent of. Purify my heart and mind so that my will can be aligned with yours and I can ask in alignment with your will. 
It's so easy to just rush to what I want, what I want. And what we may not realize, what I may not always realize, is that we could be asking with the wrong motives if we have not created space for God to purify our hearts and our minds. We have to be careful and look out for this war within. Because this war within, if we give into it, can lead to a place of corrupted motives. It's the problem with us, the problem within us, which is why we must follow the Spirit. But we'll get to more of that in a moment. James continues to elaborate on the problem with people in James 4, verses 4 through 6. He says, adulterers. He's really speaking to believers here. He's not talking about sexual adultery. He's talking about a spiritual adultery of, hey, you, you say you're following. Listen to what he says. Don't you know that to be friends with the world means being enemies with God? So anyone who wants to be friends with the world is setting themselves up as God's enemies. Or do you suppose that when the Bible says he yearns jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us, it doesn't mean what it says? But God gives more grace, so it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James is quoting Proverbs here. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now once again, here in just three verses, James addresses a lot. But there are two major concepts that I would like to highlight here. First, James addresses friendship with the world and the problem that we deal with. And then he also addresses pride. But first, friendship with the world. Sometimes, I've observed within the church, there are two extreme responses to friendship with the world. The one extreme response is, oh, you know what? We just can't be around the world at all. So we create our own little, what I call, holy huddles, where we're just away from everybody in our own little echo chambers, and then we're not really being salt and light to the world as Jesus called us to be. You see, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And so we don't want to say, oh, I'm avoiding friendship with the world, so I'm just hanging out in my own little group. No, there's still a call to be present in the world. But the other extreme that happens sometimes is we take verses like when Paul says, oh, I became all things to all people. And we go, oh, you know, I'm just, yes, I, I just, per, you know, sometimes I have to just participate in sin because I'm becoming all things to all people. And so now people think I'm relatable. And so through participating in sin, I can just bring other people to Jesus. It's like, no, that's, that's also extreme. That's not what James is talking about here. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he says to be in the world but not of the world. There's this, there's this tension for us to live in where out of our friendship with God, we then actually impact the world through the power of his spirit working in us. So we're not supposed to just retreat from the world, but we're also not just to give in to all of the ways of the world just so we could say, oh, I'm being an evangelist. Okay, when was the last time you actually shared Jesus with somebody in that mode? Uh, so th we have these two extremes. But there's a, there's a different way of living where, yes, by being collected with the people of God, we sharpen one another so that we can go out into the world and engage the world. And, yes, relate to the world. But then ultimately bring them to Christ. Bring the world to Christ. Show the love of Christ. So we have to be careful. What do we mean by friendship with the world? Well, that means that we're not going to give into the ways of the world, but we're also going to be salt and light in the world. Secondly, James addresses pride here. And this is, this is a really important subject. Some, it, it, it could be argued that pride is the most addressed sin in all of the Bible. But yet, how often do we really wrestle with it? Or how often do we maybe go to a small group or been in a small group and say, I'm just struggling with pride right now. Pray for me. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And how can we allow the Holy Spirit to bring that out of your life? How can we move into a new life that Christ has for us and move away from the old? Pride is destructive. Today we describe pride as narcissism. And it's so easy to point the finger at someone else. Oh, that person's a narcissist. That person's a narcissist. That person's a narcissist. Oh, that person. And, and there's so much finger pointing at others. But what's going on within us? This will not be on the screen. This is from Professor Stephen Taylor. It's a little bit of a longer quote, but it's, 
an insight that describes narcissism. I just want to let this sit with us for a moment. He said, one of the human race's biggest problems has been that people who occupy positions of power are often incapable of using power in a responsible way. In more recent times, it seems as though power attracts ruthless and narcissistic people with a severe lack of empathy and conscience. People with these personalities can't sense other people's feelings or see the world from any perspective apart from their own. They don't have a sense of conscience or guilt to stop them from behaving immorally. They feel superior and enjoy manipulating and controlling other people. At the same time, they need to feel respected and admired and like to be the center of attention. Research, for example, shows that people with narcissistic and psychopathic traits have a strong desire for dominance and are disproportionately common in leadership positions. It's a good call for all of us. If you find yourself in a leadership role or position, ask yourself, who and what is shaping my motives? If you've seen any of this at work within your life, an inability to receive a critique, an inability to receive any type of constructive feedback, an inability to listen to any type of, hey, we're concerned about you. Ask yourself, where is narcissism or pride at work in my life? The best way for us to get out of the cycle of the problem that affects all people, this war within us of friendship with the world and pride that leads to destruction, the best path forward is to recognize, hey, I have a problem. And Jesus will lead us to the solution. Jesus will guide us to healing. And that's the path that James begins to provide for us in the rest of the text in James chapter 4. We see here the prescription for the problem. The prescription for the problem is what James begins to provide for us in James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. So if you're taking notes, you can write that down, the prescription for the problem. I used to work at a shoe store, as I've talked to some of you about before. I've even shared on a Sunday morning. And... You know, my New Balance 990s right here. I know they're so fly, my dad's shoes. But I care about footwear after working at this store because we saw a lot of problems with people's feet. But at this store, when I first got hired, the owner said to me, hey, Scott, we're like a pharmacy for feet. Because we would take scripts from different doctors for custom shoes and custom orthotics. And we had one coworker who, for some reason, did not like to follow whatever the script said. <laughs> And so whatever script, because he was just more concerned about selling shoes to people than he was, I, I actually I don't want to get into his motives, but anyways, he just, he, he just wanted to sell shoes to people. And so he would, we would joke with him in the back, we're like, dude, you can't do this. Like the doctor wants this for this person's feet. He's like, no, 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 I know better. Like, you really know better? Do you really know? Now, there were occasional moments where we knew about a product that the, that the doctor didn't know about because, you know, they just had not been in the store for a while. But this guy, I'd be like, every once in a while, dude, you cannot be doing this right now. He's like, oh, no, 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 I know better. And I would just think, oh, my goodness, if these people knew, this customer knew what was happening with their prescription right now, they may not be the happiest person in the world. God has given us the prescription, the script in Christ Jesus, a way of life in Christ to move forward, to move out of the problem. But do we always follow it? Or have we been turning elsewhere? Do we go look for a script to be filled somewhere else other than Jesus? The way of healing that's made possible in Jesus, it's simple, but it's also sometimes difficult to do. It's a simple prescription, but it can be difficult to do because it means that we start to change a little bit. It means that we surrender our way of life and surrender to Jesus. James describes it this way in James 4, verses 7 through 10. Submit to God then. All of what James is about to be said could be summarized in those three words. Submit to to God. Resist the devil and he will run away from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Make your hands clean, you sinners, and make your hearts pure, you double-minded lot. 
Make yourselves wretched, mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy, and he will exalt you. That's like a succinct version of Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says, Have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who though being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And then he walks through how Jesus took on the form of a servant, of a slave, and then he went to the, cru- he went to the cross, and then from that he was exalted. It's from the path of humility that Christ was exalted. It's from the path of submitting to God and humbling ourselves before God that we will then experience the abundant and full life that has been made possible only in Christ. But the prescription of pride says, I can do things my way. The prescription of pride says, I can figure it out on my own. The prescription of pride says, I'm going to go turn to another solution outside of Christ. The prescription of pride says, it's all on me. The prescription of pride says, I have to figure this out myself. But if we run from pride and submit to God and humility, there is a healing that is available there. There is a healing that has been made possible. And in submitting to God, what we are actually doing then, and James describes this, is we are resisting the devil and we are resisting the ways of the enemy. And I know that some of you have probably felt stuck in some cycles. You've probably felt stuck in sin. And my, my, my invitation for you this morning is to submit to God. Submit to Jesus. Follow him Turn from sin and resist the devil. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright describes it this way. He says, the devil is a coward when he is resisted with the prayer that claims the victory of Jesus on the cross. He knows he is beaten. Amen. When we pray in the authority of Jesus, not my authority, not our own authority, but the authority of Jesus... And what was accomplished on the cross, the devil will flee because there is victory in Christ. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. Death, where's your victory gone? Death, where has your sting gone? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thank God he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus the Messiah. And we live in the victory of Jesus and declare the victory of Jesus. We start living in a different reality, away from the old and in the new. This is, Jesus is the prescription for the problem. I know it sounds simple. I know it might sound like Sunday school. But the prescription is to take up our cross and follow him. It's a simple idea, but it can be difficult to do. But to resist the devil in the name of Jesus. And then that leads us to... Where James is going next, the process for progress, or the process for growth. You could say it that way. The process for growth. I like watching basketball, football, different sports, but basketball is one of my favorite sports to watch and attempt to play. I'm not very good, but I, I try to play every once in a while. You know, having the baby, it's, it's been difficult. Uh, I haven't been able to get on the court as much, which is kind of sad, so I... Anyways, I should stop lamenting that right now. But uh, one of my favorite players to watch, it was a player who played long before I, yeah, well, he played before I was born. I was born in 93, and so Magic Johnson played, played mostly in the 1980s. But I love watching highlights of Magic Johnson. I've even watched a documentary or two about Magic Johnson. And if you know anything about Magic's game, he was exciting to watch. There's a reason he had the nickname Magic. <laughs> But after Magic's first game in the NBA, the Los Angeles Lakers, the team that he played for, they won the game. And Magic went insane. Have you ever seen this clip? It's wild. Magic went nuts like they had just won. The the announcer on television literally says, Magic is celebrating like they just won the NBA championship. He was going crazy. Now, if you don't know anything about basketball, there are 82 games in an NBA season. So this is just game one. And rookie Magic Johnson is going crazy. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar comes up to Magic after the game in the locker room. Kareem was a veteran player. And he said to Magic, Magic, we have 81 more games to go. (laughs) We can't have you doing that every time we win. The reason I bring that up is sometimes I think that's how we handle our journey with Jesus. Well, I would suggest that our journey with Jesus is should be more so like, hey, yes, there are moments of celebration. Yes, we need to celebrate. Did you know celebration is actually a spiritual discipline? 
So yes, we should be people of celebration. But I would view our journey of faith more so as, yes, we have mountaintop moments where we have celebration. Yes, there are valleys, but then we're back on a mountain, but it's all connected. So that we're in the valleys, we remember and we can see the moments of celebration. And then when we're in a moment of celebration, yes, there's a humility that comes with remembering the valley, but it's all connected and it's all a part of the growth process. There's suffering and celebration and becoming like Jesus. But my concern is that sometimes, instead of viewing our faith journey as we have mountains and valleys, yet it's all connected and we're, all, and we're growing on this trajectory, sometimes I feel like in conversations I have with Christians that it's almost viewed as if, yeah, there was this mountaintop moment at one point in my life. But you know what? It's never said this way. This is just kind of a metaphor I've made up in my head. Hopefully it makes sense. And it feels like a lot of Christians have this mountaintop moment, this moment of celebration, this moment that they can identify. And instead of growing from that moment through the valleys and back to a mountain and through the valleys and a mountain and then maybe one mountain after another and then a valley and then a few valleys, however that works for you in your life. It almost feels like, in some conversations I have, a Christ follower has a mountaintop moment. They climb off the mountain. They go down the mountain. They go find a boat by some water. They row out on the boat to the water far off, and they can see the mountain in the distance. And the mountain is this thing that we occasionally talk about. Or the mountain is this thing that we kind of cling to because it makes us feel good. But it's really become so distant and so foreign that it's not really affected our life or helped us to grow in any way. That our moment of celebration as a Christ follower is just something that we look at that makes us feel good about the past, but it's not connected to a process of growth. And my concern is that we're just sitting around celebrating the victory from the first game. We're just celebrating the victory from this distant mountain, and we have not committed to the process. We have not always committed to growth and moving along and saying, hey, there's going to be some mountains and valleys and celebration, and the celebration is connected to the next season, that we are signing up for a new way of life, not just some mountain we experienced off in the distance a long time ago, but there's a process for growth, that it's not disconnected, but we are to live a connected life of constantly seeking to grow in Christ. The story goes on. The story didn't end with that one mountaintop moment, however many years ago it was. There's more to the story, and it can all be connected. There's a process for growth. So yes, we celebrate, but we also continue to move forward. And James continues to lean into this. James talks about this process of celebration and growth in Christ. I'm going to highlight verse 8 again, verse 10, and then we'll walk through verses 11 and 12 as well. James 4, 8, and then 10 through 12. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, my dear family. Anyone who speaks evil against another family member or passes judgment against them speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, one judge, who can rescue or destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So James is, gives a pretty simple process for us to move forward. As we're moving from the mountains to the valleys in different ways of growth and following Jesus. James simply invites us to draw near to God and then God will draw near to us. In other words, don't be friends with the world but be friends with God. But more on that in a moment. James ends this with two critical warnings for those who are followers of Jesus. One, he says... Don't speak evil or poorly of others. James, once again, is talking about speech as he did earlier on in the letter. Don't speak evil or poorly of others. And then he says, don't judge others. I wonder if for some of us the reason we've drifted in our faith 
Or I wonder if for some the reason you have drifted in your faith today or the reason you have drifted away from Christ is because you found justifications in your mind as to why you can speak poorly of others. And you found justifications in your mind as to why you can judge others. And sometimes we wonder, why do I not feel closely with God right now? Dare to ask yourself, how have I been speaking of others? And have I been judging others? Are we speaking words of life and hope and justice and truth that would be consistent with Jesus? Are we judging others? Well, I'm not judging, but I'm just saying. What you're just saying (laughs) sounds a lot like judgment. When I decide to judge, when you decide to judge, James says there's one judge, God alone. So when I decide or you decide to put, put ourselves in the seat of judgment, what we're saying is, God, you're not cutting it right now. And I'm a better judge than you. And I know better than you. I can be a better judge. And that goes back to pride, where James began this whole thing. And I think it's interesting that James is two major warnings for growth (laughs) are to watch our words and to watch how we judge others. See, some people say, oh, Christianity is just about all the things you can't do. Well, there's some truth to that. When we don't speak poorly of others, we are then set free to speak words of life to others. So whenever we don't do something in following Jesus, we are set free to do something else. When we don't judge others, we are then set free to love others as Christ has loved us. So behind every don't, there is a liberation in Christ and the power of his spirit that has now been made possible. There's now something we can do. And this all starts when we draw near to God. And this drawing near to God could be summarized in a sense of saying, instead of being friends with the world, let's seek to be friends with God. Now, that might sound like kind of a foreign concept to some, especially if you have a church background, the idea of being friends with God. Wait, I'm supposed to submit to God. That's what James says. How can I submit but also be friends? There are a lot of dimensions to our relationship with God. And I want to demonstrate to you, as we close out this message, the power of friendship and the importance of friendship with God so that we're not friends with the world. Because the friendship with the world leads to the war within, which leads to destruction. Once again, to quote New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he says it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is astonishing. It is. Think about that for just a moment. God will draw near to you. God is ready and waiting. He longs to establish a friendship with you. A friendship deeper, stronger, and more satisfying than you can ever imagine. So yes, he is our king. Yes, he is our ruler. But he also desires to call us friend and for us to be friends with him. Now you might be thinking, Scott, why is that so important? Think about it this way. Your closest friends are not only the people who you have great memories with, although that is a part of friendship, Your closest friends are not just the people who you get together with, although that is a part of friendship. Your closest friends are the ones who you can walk through any struggle and any season of life with. This past week, I was listening to an interview with Joshua Weigel, who's the director of a new movie called Sound of Hope. Tells a story of a pastor and his wife who start a ministry. It's a true story for foster and adoptive care. And the director, Joshua Weigel himself, also is a foster parent. And the interviewer who was interviewing Josh acknowledged, he said, hey, fostering can be challenging. He said, how did you and your wife stay close in your marriage through the process of fostering? 
And Joshua first acknowledged his faith in God, but then after that, he said something that I thought was really interesting. He said, we were able to work through that season together because me and my wife are friends, and we'd established a friendship. The deepest, closest friendships. Yes, we create memories. Yes, we laugh together, but deep, meaningful friendship is also a relationship that can work through the deepest, most complex struggles of life. And I wonder if some of us in our moments where we've had a crisis of faith, if the reason you considered walking away from God in your crisis of faith is because you had not yet established a friendship with God. But when you establish a friendship, there's a connection, there's an intimacy that can weather any storm. And so that's why I would suggest to us that it's so important that we neglect friendship with the world and embrace friendship with Jesus. And out of that friendship with Jesus, we then allow him to work through us wherever it is that he has placed us. That we don't allow the world to influence us, but through Christ and our friendship with him, we begin to influence the world. Because your friends, they do. They change you. They shift you. You, you start to become more like them. So out of our friendship with Jesus, may we become more like him. And what some of us don't even realize is that Jesus actually uses the word friendship when talking to his followers. So yes, there's a submission. Yes, he's our king. But also we must develop a friendship with him. And in that humbling and drawing near to him and building that friendship, we will be able to resist the ways of the world, resist the enemy, and in the victory of Jesus and becoming like him, we will experience a powerful friendship that can lead us and guide us through any season. So as I close this in prayer this morning, I'm going to begin my prayer by reading to you the words of Jesus from John chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. If you would please bow your heads in this moment. Jesus says, no one has a greater love than this, to lay down your life for your friends. You are my friends if you do what I tell you. I'm not calling you servants any longer. Servants don't know what their master is doing, but I have called you friends because I've let you know everything I heard from my father. Jesus says, I've called you friends. Jesus, I pray for every one of us in here today that we would establish a deep, close, intimate friendship with you. And yes, that friendship will be filled with joy and triumph and victory in you, Christ. But it will also be filled with knowing you and knowing your peace and comfort in trying times and trying seasons. Lord, I pray for anyone in here today who's been struggling with the war within, who's been struggling with pride, who's been struggling with wanting to be friends with the world and resisting the way that you have, Jesus, I pray that they would feel the power of your Holy Spirit working in their hearts and minds today and that you would set them free today, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you call us friends. And I pray that all of us would lean into becoming friends with you, Jesus, through studying your word, through prayer, through growing in community together, and I pray that we would commit to the process of progress that simply starts with submitting to you and drawing near to you. And you have promised that you would draw near to us. Reveal to us any pride that is at work within our lives. Reveal to us any sin or anger that has been at work in our hearts and minds. We repent of that, Jesus. I pray that we would move away from sin and submit to you, Jesus. And in that, become more and more like you. Thank you for the life that you've promised us and only you can give us. And may we seek first your kingdom above all else. In your name I pray. And everyone said, amen. amen.